Jean Rouge is known in different circles in different ways for people in anthropology and people in documentary. His extraordinary body of work and constant innovation and invention as a filmmaker in terms of both what you see on screen and his work off screen in terms of his relationships with the people with whom he worked, his commitment to having works cycle back into the worlds that they came from, especially in Africa, are uh, in a sense unparalleled. He um, He's influenced so many people, but hardly anyone has ever been able to make films like him again. Well, I had the very good fortune to study with uh, Rouche in the summer of 79. He was just constantly out there showing work, engaging with people, interested in people. And like a lot of French anthropologists, uh, Rouche spent a very, very long time in the field. He worked for many, many years in West Africa. He originally went there to study migration patterns because it's particularly it's, as a consequence of colonialism, he became very friendly with these people. And while he wrote these kinds of reports were kind, that were kind of statistical studies, if you will, or fairly dry studies of their migration patterns, he was at the same time extremely involved in what was going on in their daily lives. He was very impressed with their religious lives. He was very concerned about the consequences of colonialism. And I think it could be said that he turned to the camera, which he, he had no training, as a way of telling the other side of the story, of giving the life and the vitality and the creativity of these people's lives some recognition. One of the reasons that he's perennially attractive to generations of anthropologists further down the line is that he was so ahead of his time in terms of the kinds of things he got interested in showing about people in the way he used film. Um, and in particular, the way he used film is what he called anthropologie partagée, or shared anthropology. And he recognized right away that any of the reports he wrote or his thesis, any of these kinds of things, would be published in France. They would be read by French intellectuals, uh, other people at the Musée de l'Homme where he worked. But in the end, they wouldn't circulate back to the people he was studying. And there was no way he felt he could use the written word to really be back in dialogue with the people who he felt he was learning from. So... He kind of discovered the camera. Famously, he bought this camera, a wind-up um, Bell & Howell, I think, originally, three-minute, you know, like very short amounts of film that he could even shoot. It was a silent film at the time um, that he recognized that this was a way he could produce something collectively with people and that he could also show it back to them. And this was a process. He learned over time how to do this in a more successful way and eventually started making films that have come to be known as ethnofictions that were collaborative projects with his African friends. So Rouge and Marant met at a film festival in 1959. I can't tell you that I understand exactly what brought the two of them together, except they got interested in making this film about a tribe in Paris. And I think that intrigued Rouge as a way to kind of re-enter life in Paris. And um, Moran was uh, really impressed with the way which would work with just everyday people and be able to, you know, build a film around that without, as he would say, revolvers and suspense and, you know, all the elements that would go into sort of, sort of melodramas of the time. Ce film n'a pas été joué par des acteurs, mais vécu par des hommes et des femmes qui ont donné des moments de leur existence à une expérience nouvelle de cinéma vérité. Sometimes Chronicle is seen as sort of like completely de novo, like, oh, no one ever made a film like this. It's really extraordinary. Somehow this combination of Jean Rouge working with Edgar Morin and Rouge taking some of his ideas from his African work into Paris and Morin trying to make a film without celebrities, you know, produced this very amazing document that really has stood the test of time. When you see the film that Rouge made just prior to this you see right away where so much of the work that's happening in Chronicle is coming from, and some, a lot of the ideas for being extremely reflexive, for the filmmakers to actually be literally in the film itself, so the film's construction is revealed to the audience. Et toi, tu es ému? Moi, c'est-à-dire, je, bon, ça fait le nombre de fois qu'on a vu ce film a fini par atténuer l'émotion, mais moi, je, je suis très ému, finalement. Where Rouge had the biggest differences with Morin in Chronicle of the Summer has to do a lot with the um, kind of sobriety that Morin brought to the film and a lot of interest in 
both politics, but uh, which was certainly a shared interest, but also psychoanalysis, whereas Rouch was um, fundamentally interested in um, play and joy, if I can say that. I mean, he, they actually talk about it in the transcripts <laughs> of their dialogues. So I think those were points of considerable tension in making the film. When you watch the film, you can really feel the difference between the parts that are guided by Moran and the parts that are guided by Rouge. They built into the film this kind of method of having these meals, these big meals, and they would bring the various people together who they wanted to be the main characters, and this was Moran's idea. For Rouge, I think he didn't quite anticipate how much of a change it would be for him because in Africa he was always working with people he knew extremely well and in circumstances that he more or less understood. And um, all of a sudden he was working with people he barely had met and Moran wanted to do these kind of very intense interviews and you know, some of them have a very psychoanalytic feel to them. And Rouge writes about being kind of uncomfortable with that and people he barely knew, and suddenly they were having these revelatory interviews, like the big, the scene, the famous scene with Mary Lou, and Moran closes the door, it feels like a psychoanalyst is, like, having the big moment with her. And they were constantly battling over who the technical staff would be, because Rouge, for example, had seen the work of a French-Canadian guy, Michel Bro from Montreal, uh, who he was very impressed because he was able to walk with the camera, what he, what Rouge called, Rouge often made up these funny names, he called Pedo Vision. So he, would, he said, we really need to have these shots of people walking through the streets of Paris and being able to just follow them, you know, in the same position we might occupy if we were just walking with them. So he insisted, for example, on hiring Michel Bro, and of course the Parisians took offense at that. But in you know, a lot of the really wonderful scenes in the film are shot by him because he, was, he had sort of figured this out. All of these things seem very routine these days, but they were really important innovations at the time. So they were struggling over um, you know, everything from camera angles to uh, technical staff to constant focus on talk. So when there's a point in the films where they everyone goes on vacation, it's August in Paris, and suddenly the whole tone of the film changes. It's, very, it's a little more antic, it's much less talk, it's much more activity, and you really feel the shift in who has directorial control. And also, as Bruce says, I want to see people having fun, and I want to see people um, enjoying their lives. And, you know, all the scenes in Paris that Moran is directing around the table, they're very kind of dark and morose, and everyone has troubles, and they're often alluding to things. You know, many of these people were part of a group called um, Socialism or Barbarism that um, Moran was involved with, and um, Rouch didn't realize a lot of this. So I think a lot of the entanglements in the film just had to do with differences in approach, differences in their relationships with the people in the film. I think Rouge was very, very concerned to bring the question of Africa in France into the film, so that's certainly a big part of his contribution. Nadine, who had been living in Africa, and Landry, who is there as the African student, are people who come through Rouge's network. So slowly the, the group starts to kind of pull itself together across their different kind of networks. One of the things that's very important to remember about Rouge is that he was trained as an engineer. He loved the technical aspects of the camera, and when they started to make Chronicle of a Summer, 60 mil sync sound wasn't really there yet, but it was on the cusp. And uh, so he worked with um, uh, someone who was very well known for their incredible capacity for making cameras, uh, Couton, to try and rig up a camera for them that would have a kind of sync sound function and that they could come back every night to the factory and he would fix it and work on it and make sure it was continuing to operate. That kind of invention is... Um, sometimes harder for people in the contemporary moment to appreciate, first of all, because it's off screen. We don't see that invention, but also because we're just, of course, totally used to cameras doing the most amazing things. And it's hard to imagine a time when just being able to have sync sound was a huge and ambitious project. So without that technological shift, he wouldn't have been able to add those beautiful, poetic aspects of the film. And if you asked to go to the street, 
et de poser à des inconnus la question « Êtes-vous heureux ?» Vous iriez I mean, the scene with Marceline remembering being deported and coming back and not recognizing her brother is, is just incredibly moving. Toi, tu me répondais. Tu es jeune, toi, tu reviendras. Moi, je reviendrai sûrement pas. Subsequent to this festival where they met each other, Morin coins in some critical writing the term cinéma vérité or cinéma of truth which often gets misinterpreted. It's, in a sense, an homage to the work of Ziga Vertov, the Russian filmmaker who had coined the term Kino Pravda, meaning also the truth of cinema. In both cases, they're meaning not that the film is showing us the truth, but the film provokes its own kind of truth, that, that within the film we see a kind of truth emerging. So very differently than the direct cinema folks in the U.S. at the time who were like, the camera will tell the truth, it's the fly on the wall, we'll just follow people. The idea of interfering and showing people making up a film at the same time, you know, was completely shocking. And often the two movements are considered to be very much the same, and they're not. They're very much in dialogue. So they were very interested in creating these kind of scenarios to provoke a kind of exploration of what the truth might be about the lives of Parisians at this time. And I think just by the fact that there was such a diversity of people in the film, they were already anticipating that there were many ways to imagine what that might be. Rouche believed that people in performance or in ritual or in any form of dramatization, people only become more of who they already are. So that there's not a lack of truthfulness because people are performing or because people are in ritual. I mean, that he really sort of extends this from his view of ritual. They're just revealing another aspect of themselves. I think that they were somewhat naively hopeful that somehow all these people would come to really love each other through the film and um, be comfortable with each other's representations, and that actually did not occur. It's part of, I think, what makes the film really successful for most viewers. And then there's the ending is as they're parting, they, they leave the museum and they're on the sidewalk. They say, okay, well, we're, nous sommes dans le bain. Nous sommes dans le bain. That's been an interesting concluding statement to the film because it's been translated as, I think, we're in trouble. And um, the French idioms would suggest it's saying something more like we're implicated, where it's not, we're not outside of this process. We're very much in the mix here. Nous arrivons à ceci. C'est qu'actuellement, le film, jusqu'ici, s'était cantonné dans un, un univers relativement personnel, relativement individuel, euh, débouche sur euh, le, la situation de cet euh, été 1960. Oui. Alors, on, on, on y va. Oui, mais moi, je voudrais bien savoir ce qu'ils pensent. On y va. Oui, on y va, on y va. On y va. But I think the reason people have focused on that is because um, the question of their role in the film and their reflexivity is, is, is kind of key. And it's almost like an ethical dimension to the film. Like, are they standing back from the film and just looking at people, or are they actually seeing themselves as implicated in the whole process of it and part of anything that results from that? So I think that's part of the debate about that ending of the film.